bathrooms are in non-contact visitation. We would bring the inmates into the hallway of the senior center. They would be strip searched, clothed, brought in here, and they'd be sitting on the seats that you're sitting on now. Around the outside of the U, family members or loved ones would enter through the uh, door there, and they'd be on the outside, and they'd sit on the windows. We did this for a while, but we found out that people on the outside were rolling on dollar bills, and they were lacing it with LSD, and they were putting them through those little tiny holes, if you look. Oh, Believe it or not, they were rolling them up that small, and they were putting them through there. Wow. Yeah, no, it's a tight hole. But when we found that out, we put in the uh, steel plates, and we replaced it all with telephones to give them all a little more privacy and stop them from passing stuff inside. The prison was constructed in 1866, so one year after the Civil War, West Virginia seceded from Virginia, which seceded from the United States, so we had to have a place to put all of our inmates. We didn't have a jail, so we built this one. This was the only jail for West Virginia for a while until we uh, built other ones, such as Olive and River Regional, which we still get to this day. Behind me, you're going to see Old Sparky. And Old Sparky actually is the electric chair that was used here at this prison. It wasn't housed here, it was over in the death house. And I'll show you that when we make it out to the north yard. This was constructed in about 1950 by an inmate named Paul Glenn. West Virginia did not have an electric chair. We were still hanging at the time. The warden wanted to switch over to the electric chair because he heard it was more humane. It was not. <laughs> so, so we sent an inmate over to uh, uh, Columbus, and he drew it up after looking at it. We brought him back, and he built this one out of solid oak. So an inmate actually did design and put this thing together. Of course, that didn't make Paul Glenn too popular around these parts, so we had to transport him out for his own safety. They were trying to kill him because, let's be honest, you don't put a death machine in prison and people let you live. So all the wiring and these three buttons are the originals, and an electrician would come in the day before of an execution, and he would pick a button at random. It would be different every time. He would wire all three of them up, but only one button actually electrocuted the gentleman. They put every officer in this prison's name in a hat and they'd draw three. And they'd draw another three and they were alternates. If any officer said they couldn't do it, they were terminated on the spot, told to get out, and the alternate took his spot. This was something that had to be done. And that was the only way to make it fair for all the officers. The phone is really just there to uh, represent a last minute stay. We didn't electrocute anybody until after 9 p.m. That way it gave the governor all day if he wanted to call a community sentence. That never happened. Now, I said that the uh, three officers were chosen. The only way that that didn't happen is if the warden or deputy warden of this facility decided that they wanted to flip this or hit the button instead of flip the switch themselves. That never happened, but if it would have happened, the warden or the deputy warden would have received a bonus check at $25. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Impressive. Now, I'm sure you notice know some of the paintings, especially the New River Gorge as you walk in here. That's actually done by an inmate by the name Danny Lay Layman. He was the head of the Avengers motorcycle gang that pretty much ran this prison from the mid 70s to the mid 80s. Uh, Layman ends up getting killed over on the North Wall uh, by the Aryan Brotherhood, and I'll point that out to you when we get over there because the Aryan Brotherhood is going to take over from the Avengers. The drawings on the outside that you may have noticed, they're done by an inmate named Billy Foster, and he was good. He is a great artist. Yeah, if you haven't got a chance to look at him, please do. Um, he actually has oil paintings and galleries. He was that good. He was that talented. In Parkersburg, there's actually a gallery, and one of his paintings is hanging in there. Uh, you can buy the prints here, and 40% uh, of that goes to um, cancer research, because Billy died of cancer, and the, another 40% it goes to his victims. Billy wanted all the money uh, that he got off those most humorously to go to his victims because he felt real bad about it. And then, you know, we take a little bit here for profit to keep maintaining the air. So, if you want to take it, you can check those out. Uh, the only person who was ever um, had their sentence commuted and they didn't get executed here was a woman. Her name is Madeline Dean. This was 1948. And there's a newspaper in the um, museum that you might have noticed that said that she was hung, or well, she wasn't. The governor called at the last minute. He didn't want to have the only woman to ever be executed in West Virginia to be on his conscience. Mm -hmm. So he commuted her sentence to life, but he did it so close 
to the execution of the newspapers were already printed that she got home. That's how close it was. Are there any questions? No? All right, well, if you follow me, we'll go to prison. <laughs> So this is a maximum security prison, but these guys on the south side, which is where we are now, with general population, they have pretty much free reign. At the top of every hour, only hour, there would be a regular call. The officer would make the regular call, and they could go pretty much wherever they wanted, to industries. Industries had all of the jobs that they would have had. They had carpentry, welding, license plate making. They even made uh, books for the blind and translated them to bread. They did everything here. Everything was in house, essentially. So they had 10 minutes to do that. Another thing that you're going to notice just from in there down here is how muggy and hot it got. This is one of the reasons that this place ends up getting closed in 1995. You have to remember, this place did not close hundreds of years ago. Literally, we had inmates here in 1995. It was closed because it violated your Eighth Amendment right to, in your Constitution. Cruel and unusual punishment. You see on the fourth tiers of cells here, it actually gets upwards of 135 degrees, which is enough to kill you. So inmates found interesting ways in order to keep it cool. One of these ways, especially along from here, they break out all these windows. As you can imagine, that did not sit very well with maintenance. Okay? Maintenance got their revenge though, because they wouldn't fix the windows until spring. <laughs> all right, so. Again, we're getting hypothermia. We're getting inmates literally waking up with frost, a layer of frost on them, believe it or not, and frostbite. Conditions here were beyond the door, but we had live wires explode, exposed. The healthcare, non existent. All of this accumulated in 95, they decided that enough's enough, this is cruel and unusual, and they shut it down. The surviving inmates who are still alive today, I worked as a correctional officer for a little over a year down south, and I actually had inmates that I worked with that were from here. So they're still around. It would get so cold in here, sometimes the floor would sweat, and then it would freeze. And that would, it would be so thick you could literally ice skate on it. Yeah. Okay, I mean, it, it, it was crazy what it was like in here. This red line that goes all the way down, if you'll notice, is lined perfectly up with our gun port. We did what was called an inmate walk. An inmate with one hand as high up on the wall as he could, the other hand on the shoulder of the inmate in front of him, and when he looked down, he wasn't allowed to look at you or speak to you. If he did, he could be beaten. We had what was called a kneeling jenny. It's a ward that's essentially warped. This was in the early days. What they would do is they would strip you down, they could tie you to it, and they'd beat you with a leather strap that was three to four inches wide, and they'd soak it in vinegar and salt water, and they'd hit you with total exhaustion. We had people die from this. In fact, we had a two year stretch in our history where two inmates a month died from that. And we had a warden who did it to eight inmates himself. An investigation was held. And they told them that, you know what, you might just be a little too harsh. Would you mind stepping down? So we did. Um, I know, that's crazy. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the whips that we used on these guys, we also made. We made whips, we made whips for the, uh, the circus, Martin Brothers, and we also the old Zorro movies, every single Zorro movie whip, except for like the 90s ones. Those are our whips. They also used them to beat the inmates, so it kind of made this full circle, I guess. Yeah, yeah that's crazy. But if you step over the line, you can be shot. That's why it's lined up with the gun. You guys have any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this prison was actually the third most deadly prison from the day that it opened until the day that it closed. The first one is Leavenworth over in Kansas. I never remember the second one. I apologize. But the third one was us. And we had articles written about us in New York. And New York has Sing Sing. So that lets you know how brutal it was here. This place is not a place you want to end up. This was the end of the road. Follow me, guys.
And we let other people come in here, like the Marines, and they do hostage situation training, coming into rooms, clearing rooms, that kind of thing. Well, one day a Marine comes in here, and he is all going to hug. I tell you, he's got his night vision goggles on, he hops over the fence, and he spins around right away. First thing he sees is that little guy staring at him. He has a gut reaction, hits it with the butt of his rifle, and I'm like, what the Marines is For sure. It's still Christmas. Wow. And it's almost July, so I guess it kind of counts. Christmas in July? We can put a little engraving in the tree. Oh, how cute. Oops. Absolutely not. That's way above what they had. Over there, um, 
that's the, that's the same bubble that the nurse would have been in the pill window, except that this would have been the guard view. There would have been a guard in there with a 12-gauge shotgun. Those portholes open up and allow him to shoot down into here. All the squares on the floor is where the tables would have been. These are stainless steel tables that are bolted to the floor so they couldn't pick them up and hit them, hit each other with them. And they sat five individuals at a time. We have two different lines. The one on your left, that would have been a general population line, and the other one would have been dietary, for diabetics or religious reasons. See, we did have we did have the black Muslims in here, and they weren't allowed to have food. We obviously had people with Jewish faith, and they're not allowed to have food either. We also had a lot of diabetics and other health related issues. So that's why we have the second line. Now you're going to notice this wall over here in the corner. All right, this wall was put in place because officers would eat behind it. That's right, officers ate the same food if they wanted to pay 90 cents. They could eat the same food that the inmates did. And everybody's like, why would you eat prison food? Well, this prison operated before food services took over. See, food services has taken over for the prisons now, and food is atrocious. I can testify to that. I do work with a correctional officer. They have their own farms. These guys, these guys have their own farms. If you name it, they had they had steak once a month. They actually ate pretty well. And the officer said that there was not a better meal in Moundsville you could get for 90 cents. So they ate it a lot. The wall was put there though, so that the officers and the inmates wouldn't just sit there and stare at each other. So we didn't need any added tension. We had enough tension in here because we had every gang you could imagine. We have the KKK, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Black Panthers, the Black Hand. The black Muslims, um, you name it, we had them in here. And they killed each other on the regular. This prison has 998 confirmed documented deaths. Okay? We didn't start taking records until 1920. We were in operation in 1866. So we have softball estimate, 500 unconfirmed deaths. We know this because when they built the blue building that you'll see in a minute in 1972, when they were laying the concrete foundation, they pulled up skeletons. And when they built the south wall starting in 1929, underneath the walls, they buried people. They found, they found people buried. So we know we've got a lot undocumented. Let's just put it that way. This is the part of the tour where I let y'all go around and check out the paintings. These paintings were done by the same two that did that room in there. And if I have a very, very brave soul, very like we, we try to limit to five at a time, he wants to go back, take some pictures in the kitchen, see if they can catch Shadow Man, that's fine. But watch your step, there are plugins sticking out of the ground. Alright guys, take some pictures. <laughs> Here, yeah. 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 together for sure. Yes. people back in there right now so I knew Chris would be the first one in there. <laughs> Without hesitation.
Anything interesting back in there? Oh, I would take a shot for sure. I would just stick it in there. Um, just because it's like there's a really nice eerie blue light. Yeah, you see Ooh. what it's seeing in there? Yeah. And there's a boiler room system back there. Yeah, that's why I just got a shot back there for sure. back up front. Children were special to the inmates. If you hurt a child, you died. And the inmates here were in the records. So if you did something even worse, they knew about it, you didn't make it. So the kind side of these guys was everywhere and apparent in Moundsville. But what's crazy, we never had an incident. Never once did anybody from outside Moundsville citizens come in here. Never had an incident, never had a problem, they never hurt these people. These people were their people. They considered this their home in some crazy way. Now, after they escaped, and we did have over 500 escapes, we caught most of them. But after they escaped, they still didn't do anything in the city limits of Moundsville. When they got out of Moundsville, that's when they went back to Philly. It's insane. Follow me. Stockade left over from the Civil War. It's not there now, but that's about where it was at. 
see this prison is built by the inmates. Every stone carved by the inmates, every stone laid by the inmates. If you look in this corner right here, and you go up three from the white line, you'll see a, a, a leaf imprinted in the, in the stone. That's a true fossil, millions of years old. That's not what I want you to see. That's just the line that I want you in. If you go up nine, you'll see something inscribed into the stone. What do you see? All right, say it. Backwards. It's back, what's well, actually upside down, but it's KKK. That's what it says. See, the gangs were always here. Always here. You'll also see one underneath that metal pipe. If you look down below it, there's another KKK, and it's also upside down. The reason it's upside down, the same guy that was cutting the stone was not the same guy who was laying it. Okay, the guy laying it, he didn't care if it was up, upside down, right side up, it didn't matter to him, he just laid the stone. Uh, right here, three up on the column, you see it looks like a turkey foot or a peace sign. On the other side, it's upside down. That's actually from a witch group in the early days. It ends up turning into a, a wicked group now, but that's supposed to be a blessing room. All right. It also could have been uh, one of our Irish boys because it is a Celtic symbol, and we did have the Irish boys too. We're not really sure which one is which one is which. To be honest with you. But the point of this is to show you that we've got in ancient Indian burial mounds and grounds that this place is built on, and it's hand carved by the inmates who are putting witch symbols in it. And people still wonder why it's haunted. Inmates. They were kept there because, believe it or not, they were actually the nannies for his children or domestic servants, if you will. They cleaned everything. I mean, they did get paid because slavery was outlawed, but it was very, very small. See, it was a different class of people back in those days. They were just murderers. So, the second floor, though, with the caged in balcony, that is actually the warden's offices. So, the top three floors are all the wardens, essentially. He would walk out on this balcony and he would give instructions to the inmates back in the day. And the cage is there because inmates, just like they do today, enjoy throwing things. So, I had to put the cage in. This area right here, this would have been the rose garden. The warden's wife wanted something nice to look at, so she commissioned the, uh, the warden to do a rose garden. In the center where the light is now would have been a fountain. It would have been later replaced in the mid-30s by a flagpole. We were very patriotic during the war. And now it's a light post. <laughs> so it's had a couple different iterations. The blue building is where I told you they found the skeletons after they dug up and laid the, count, uh, the concrete foundation. That's in Industries building. It was built in 1972. Uh, it has everything, welding, uh, carpentry, leather working. They even made license plates. Now in 1982, there's a funny story. See, the license plate for West Virginia is supposed to be blue, yellow, and then the background is supposed to be white. Well, in 82, a batch of plates starts coming out that it doesn't look quite right. It's not white. It's, it's off yellow. And the guards, COs, they go in and they're like, why, why, is, this, why is this yellow? And the correction, the correction officers get told by the inmates that it's faulty paint. Paint's just faulty. Now, they knew that was wrong because it's the same paint it's always been. It ends up the inmates were peeing in the paint. So from 82 to 83, West Virginians were driving around with pee plates. If you look in our museum, we actually have one of those plates still in display, and it is an awkward yellow color. All right, guys, follow me. Enough. 
You are also not only looking at the administrative building, you're also looking for the special help in Moundsville. The bottom floor at the barber shop, the post office, uh, secretary's offices. People will come in to get their haircuts. The upper floor, because it was the warden and it was a nice position, they'd have all kinds of social events. They would have church services, dances. People were in here all the time from outside. In fact, we even let prisoners out. If you were a struggling factory around here, you didn't have enough workers, you could hire inmates for 50 cents a day and they'd come work in your office. They'd walk right out the front door and come right back in. That's why we had so many escapes though, because some of them decided they didn't want to come back. Of course, most of them were caught, and usually within a month or two. Our last great escape though, actually took place under that uh, guard tower right there, the, the rifle. See, it's painted white because the inmates feel white so they would stand out a little more and we painted it up to the gun post because we don't need anybody climbing up there and getting a 308 rifle. In front of that used to sit the greenhouse, okay, and this is where the escape, the escape story comes in. The greenhouse was worked by the inmate. An officer did not go in there and look on them. It took them about a year, but what they did was they dug a tunnel 16 feet down and under the wall and then 16 feet back up. In fact, it was so well built running lights on the inside and they built a ladder out of piping. They screwed piping together so they could walk up it. On the outside they even made a wooden uh, sewer drape cover like that one over there and even painted it the same red color so when they got out they could sit it on top. However, when the three got out they were so nervous and full of adrenaline that they dropped it and went 16 feet down. They said the heck with it and they just ran away. In 1992 when this happened a kid was walking home from school, saw a big hole outside of prison. Ron Salma tells his mommy, she calls, she calls, believe it or not, she calls uh, the prison. The prison does an emergency count, three inmates short. If it wasn't for those meddling kids. Trap doors, they don't have the nooses on them yet. Orville Atkins is in the middle. His door prematurely lets go. Like I said, they don't have nooses. He falls down, breaks his leg, his ribs, and his collarbone. He's down there. The nurses look at him. One of the COs up there says, Don't worry about it, guys. I got an idea. It's one of those wooden structures that lay flat the board. They tie him to it, haul him back up there. One CO holds one side. They put the nooses on him, drop. They hung him anyway. We were 
were real nice back then. Actually, you were quite mean. So. Anyway, the razor wire is put in in 86, okay? And that razor wire is built by the Gillette Company. That's the man for you. And everybody thinks, oh yeah, it looks real sharp. It's got those little razor blades on it. That's incorrect. The entire thing is actually one razor blade. Those little hooks are called fish hooks. They're designed to get embedded in your muscle. When your adrenaline freaks you out, it actually works deeper. See, that's designed for war. It's designed to bleed you out. And every once in a while, they challenge one of these guys in here to try and make it over it. It was not a pretty sight. When they put this in, they used leather gloves. That did not work. It cut right through them. They got cut up. They had to use chainmail gloves. And even then, it wasn't 100%. People still got cut stuff is still as sharp and as shiny as the day they put it up in 86. We get a lot of ghost activity out here. Obviously, it's the death house. So, a lot of our paranormal groups like to camp out here, which is cool. The oldest part of the prison is the wagon gate, though. Remember what I, I said at the end of the Civil War in 1866, it was a wooden stockade. The first thing they built was the wagon gate. And just like in the old westerns on those wagons that were caged in, that's what came through there and that's how they came through. Originally there was a set of wooden doors on the inside, and there was a very interesting escape that happened right there, and I'll talk to you that, about that in a minute. But what I want to stress to you now is that this was the only jail in prison for all of us here for a number of years. We had ladies here, and another jail in the corner, and I'll show you where that was in a minute. They were segregated from the men for obvious reasons. But the youngest person we had in here, and we had a couple 12 year olds, they were tried as adults and they were thrown in with the adults. There was no child prison. So if you were 12 or up, this is where you came. That's rough. before the first hanging, we all believe that. But since now we know that's where it happened, we don't really do the hanging stories in here anymore. But if you follow me, I'll show you what we used to do. <laughs> and you can see why we thought they hung them in here. There is a trap door, but that trap door was actually to get cargo. See, the truck would come in, the hoist would come down, they'd load cargo and take it up. But we thought maybe the first hangings were here until we found that piece of paper because this is the oldest constructed spot in the prison. It even has the gun port still on the side where they would fire in if somebody would try to escape or bust in. Now what I would do back in the day if I worked here and I was the tour guide, you guys would all be standing over here. There's a real light X somewhere and there's a yellow line. I would actually be standing on the stairwell next to that cool little handle that's hanging down. And I would be talking to you all and I'd be telling you the nice hanging stories and distracting you and then right in the middle I'd pull that cord and a dummy would fall out and you would all have witnessed the hanging. Okay? They called it shock therapy back then. Today they call it a lawsuit so we're not allowed to do that. <laughs> Now we're still owned by 
by their vision and correction. And they still can train you. That's why their trucks are still here. And every once in a while on the weekday, when we're giving tour to our inmates here, they still work actually because they cut our grass and stuff. But you all don't have to worry about that. We're going to go into the North Hall, and that's where the worst stores can kept, as I said, 22 and a half hours a day, or in their cells. When this place was built, it was supposed to hold around 700 inmates, about 750. In the heyday in the 30s, there was 3,000 people here. They stuffed three men in a seven, or I'm sorry, a five by seven cell. That's small. Y'all don't know how small that is until you actually get in here and look. But the first four cells that we're going to see, those are for the gang members. They were so bad and so dangerous, they had to be housed by themselves. And in fact, they have their own segregated shower. I'll tell you the stories about them when we get in here. Just try to imagine three men living in here. It's insane. Yeah, Chris, you got to wipe your head. <laughs> Make sure you duck, Kara. Huh? Make sure you duck. Oh, that's just big headed, not tall headed. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, she can re still reach up. I really want to. Yeah, wait, I was going to ask you. Yeah, I was going to ask you. You guys can. Get in there, Jeremy. He was a pretty bad individual. If Red said that you died, he died in 24 hours. He might not kill you himself, but an Aryan brother would. You would be dead in 24 hours, it was a guarantee. If Red did kill you himself, he was real arrogant about it. He'd come back in here and he'd play on his harmonica taps. And that's how the CEOs knew that they had to go play hide and seek for a body. <laughs> All right? Now, as I said, Red was the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood, but Blue, down here on the end, I know the names are Red and Blue, it's hilarious. But uh, his name's Elijah, and he went by Blue, actually. But Blue wanted to be the leader. So he gets the guy in cell number three, whose name is Rusty Lassiter. He gets Rusty Lassiter by himself, and he goes, hey, if you don't kill Red, I'm going to kill you. So... Rusty knows that Red likes his pills. So Rusty gets Red all doped up. And he's still so scared of Red that he stands outside the cell and says Red's name four times. And when he sees that he can't get up, then he runs in there and stabs him 37 times in the neck and throat. Yeah, he actually bled out three feet away from those fine people right there. Wow. <laughs> What's that cigarette there? People, people will come here and they'll actually leave offering cigarettes and wine. A cigarette. Because the, uh, unfortunately the Aryan Brotherhood is still a thing today. And sometimes they like to leave it. Alright, so cell number 17 down here. Alright, this is where the cells are half three people. Those four in there, like I said, are the gang leaders. They only have one guy. Does anybody else have one in there? So these ones is where three starts. And it's all the way off. There's four tiers. All of these would have three guys in them. You would have had one box right here, where they are. this one still seems today. There's ribbon holes. This one's been filled in. But there used to be a second bunk, and then the third guy would sleep on the floor on a mattress. But you would never sleep with your head next to this bean hole because people would reach in and stab you. So you would actually sleep with your head under the toilet. Yeah, and the only way that you were not going to sleep on the floor is if they killed you or if you became really special friends. Now this right here is one of the devil worshiper cells. You can see he's got his devil worshiping pentagram on the wall and yada yada. Well, he actually sued the state of West Virginia because he wanted to bring a sword in here so he could make sacrifices to the devil. It took the West Virginia courts two years to tell him no because of freedom of religion. And they just eventually said, no, you're not bringing a weapon to jail. But just have a look and try to imagine three guys. Yeah, like fish, I mean, there are no oh. in there. Yep. 
Yep, they did. They even at one point they even gave them hot plates before they tried to electrocute a CO with it, and then they took them away. See what they did was they would pee on the floor or they throw water on the floor. And they'd cut the end off the hot plate, plug it in, and put it in the uh, the liquid. Wow. These grates on the front of the doors, they're actually, come on in here guys, let's see if we can have some. These grates on the door are actually installed for the office's security. See, these guys will throw things at them, and I'm not talking food. Alright, and a lot of these guys have blood-borne diseases, AIDS, hepatitis, things like this. So whenever it became feeding time, the officers would have to don full riot gear, shields, uh, they even were given a slack vest from the Viet after the Vietnam War. They had to wear all of it to come and feed these guys. If you notice, the bean hole has all of these cut off except for one. The one missing is for the cup. No officer in their right mind, or who wanted to live very long, would reach down there and get that cup because they're going to grab your arm, pull your arm in, break it, and then stab you. Just what they're going to do. So they were actually fed out of this plexiglass contraption where they would park it in front of the door and then you would do everything through that. Yeah, it was real bad in here. Now the plumbing was also bad, all right? Let's say I was down to cell number two and I flushed the toilet, it's gonna back up in three and then into four and then into five. That's gonna daisy chain all the way down. So if you really hated your neighbor, you'd wait till about 10 o'clock at night, you'd let that stuff stew. And then you wait till they're brushing their teeth in the sink, and then you flush your toilet. Oh. Yeah, it's part of the reason why this place was closed, among all the other things that I mentioned. <laughs> so it was pretty, it was pretty deplorable conditions. Up here, you're going to notice is our metal uh, slam bar, and that's where the term "going to slammer" comes from. It slams, and it's actually the second locking system. See, this part right here, when this door is closed, matches up with this part on the opposite side and keeps it locked. But they have individual locks. So if the slam's closed, you come down here and you unlock the cell that you want open. Then you go up there and you open the slam, and it only lets that guy out. Behind you is what the gun lock. There would be an officer there during feeding time, or if they had to move any of these guys, and he would have a 12 gauge shotgun. If the officer here lost control, or if you crossed that red line as an inmate, he would shoot you. You're going to notice uh, this whole plate is on this one, but on this one right here, it's cut in half. And I'm going to tell you why. Believe it or not, this is solid steel, and they cut it with dental floss. They took Comet, or some sort of abrasive chemical, and they would put it on the dental floss. And they found out that if they worked the dental floss real tight, friction cut it. But if they worked it real loose with that abrasive material on it, it could take them months. But they could cut through solid steel with it. And they would use this to make shanks. And they would sharpen it on the floor. And I get this all the time. Wouldn't the COs notice that this is missing half? Yeah, but you gotta remember that today, it's still this way. There are way more of them than there are COs. In this entire area, there might have been two correctional officers unless they were doing feeding or transportation. And it's really loud in here. You got three people in a cell. And if you actually heard the sharpening at night when it was mostly done and you're the only CO here, are you really gonna walk down there by yourself and be like, hey, please stop sharpening your <laughs> No, you're not, it's just not gonna happen. But these guys were still really smart about it. So like, let's say number 12, it was his turn to go out on the playground, as we affectionately call the yard, as a CEO. Okay. Still breaking some of those habits. But anyway, he would walk past, and he'd be like, hey, I'm gonna do 13 reps today. And I'd be like, oh, okay. So every time he'd hear a clink, he'd be shuffin, 12 more. Clink, sharpen, 11 more. Clink, see what I'm saying? So they would still try and hide it a little bit. Down here at cell number nine is famous. All right, cell number nine, if you have Hulu, there's a show called Castle Rock. Now, Castle Rock was thrown all throughout this prison, but one of the main characters was inside this cell. You know the guy who plays Pennywise, the dancing clown, and it's the Scar or, Bill Scar Scar. his name is Norwegian. But anyway, he was in this cell a lot, and he actually actually filmed here. Now, they did not change anything. They did not add graffiti. They did not take any graffiti away. It's one of our clauses for them filming here. They're not allowed to touch any of the artwork. This was all done by a guy named Danny Atkins, you know, by Scrappy. 
All right? He was the tattoo artist for the whole prison. Now, tattooing is a class two write-up. It's still a class two write-up today. I wrote somebody up myself when I worked at St. Mary's for, for tattooing. But he would advertise through his cell, and if you saw the uh, museum, there's a shirt that's got noodles on it. That was his calling card. He, that was his billboard, if you will. He would walk around when he wasn't locked in here. When he went back to General Pop, he would walk around and have these advertisements. Okay? So please, have a look inside, take pictures, it's pretty cool. Now we had our devil worshippers, I told you about them, but we also had, uh, let's just say superstitious people. Now seven is supposedly God's number, alright? Supposedly creates the world in seven days, so that's his number. If you notice, I'm watching you, Freddie. There's hides all over the inside of it. Now, there's two theories. One, being in here made him a little good feel. And two, is that for superstitious reasons, he put the eye of God all over the cell. We're not sure which one it is, but I mean, it's literally all over the inside of it. In cell number five, they have the original porcelain that was in here. This place was constructed in, in the 20s, the cells were put in, essentially. But they had original uh, plaster. Porcelain, I'm sorry, porcelain. And they found out that they needed to break it to make it knives and stuff. So they replaced it with the steel ones. But whoever was in here, we don't have a name. Whoever was in here was apparently a pretty good inmate and uh, decided not to break the porcelain. Which one of these again? Okay. Yeah. 
actually gets stabbed and bleeds out right here by the uh, Aryan Brotherhood. He was part of the Danny was part of the Avengers. The Aryan Brotherhood, which is red, wanted to take over. So they killed him. They put him on a pipe and a hook on him. They tried to pull his brain through his eye. It doesn't work, but he did that. Yeah, life in here is not, not something that we want to see. And for that, we're going to continue on the blue. Trolley motor, 
from wheeling, and then it ran with the trolley on it. But sadly, it, it's now, you just turn it around. There was also another film here, and this one leads into the next story. It was called Night of the Hunter, and it was about Harry Powers, who was actually West Virginia's first serial killer. We hung him for killing three ladies and two children, but when they went to his house after they hung him, they found that he actually killed like 50 people. So, and we don't even know if Harry Powers is his real name or not, because he was a German immigrant, but he was going by Harry Powers, and that's what he's buried under in our cemetery. Barbershop, post office, the post office railing back there um, is actually built by inmates. It's all ironwork. And they built it because the ladies working in the post office were like, gee, I wish that our post office looked like a real post office, so they made it. Well, head this way, down to the south of all right. You can watch your stuff again, there's just enough of a way to carry it. That was the north yard, and that's the bullpens where the north inmates, the bad ones, they only got to go. The south yard's different, all right? The south side is different. This is general population, not administrative segregation like up there. These guys could go wherever they wanted starting at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they could stay out until 10 o'clock at night. They just had to move, do their movements every hour, on the hour, 10 minutes, other than count and eating, right? This is actually the field where they'd bring in the football teams, the high school, the college, and they would play against the inmates. If you notice that little cute so cougar mural on the inside, when we're back in Main Street, I'll point it out again. There's a cougar there. Their team, the inmate team, was called the West Virginia Cougars. They played everybody. In fact, 100 years ago, 1920, the Pirates came here. The Pittsburgh Pirates, and the inmates played the Pirates, and the inmates won. Which doesn't say much today, but... Huh. Back then, it was kind of a big deal. These guys were good. They didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> so they just practiced all the time. And we never had an incident. They would take candy from the com or they take candy from the commissary, and they would take it and put it up in that tower over there, and the kids on the outside, if they would return the home run ball, they'd give them a chocolate bar. You know? 
This would have been the weightlifting area. Over there were the tables. That would have been where they did letter writing, chess, uh, poker even. The wall in the back, if you look on this side, of it, you're going to see a smiley face painted. And underneath it says Legend of the Smiley Family. And the only way you could join the Smiley Family is if you gave the big grin to someone. Uh, we had a couple members here. The chapels constructed in the 80s, $20,000 from the local churches. Then the Christian inmates took money from their, their pockets that they earned through their labors in the industry, and they paid for the rest. But it's an all-denominations chapel because inside prison, you can't have one denomination because of you know, religious freedom. So this is an all-denominations faith church. We've had a couple marriages in here from the inmates and a couple of bow renewals. See, these guys weren't quite as bad as those guys. So the ones that were in here, they had a chance to go out. And if they did get out, they wanted to have something to look forward to. And this was just something that they could look forward to when they try to turn their lives around. The light building behind you was originally a radio station, an AM radio station. It's called WVPEN, WVPEN. And they did all the radio broadcasts in here. So if you wanted to hear the game, you know, when they played the Pirates, it was going through AM right there. If you wanted to uh, hear about the track meet that was going on here, right there. Later, it would be turned into the cable house, the TV house. See, every single one of these cells, believe it or not, on both sides, they have cable. And now, inmates could have cable as long as they paid the bill for it, unlike today where your tax dollars are paying for it. There is the door that goes down into the sugar shack. Now, if you were bad, and I mean really bad, you would go down there and you would go right, and that's to the hole. Now, the hole was a terrible place worse than North Hall. See, they took you down there and it could be anywhere from one to thirty days. They would strip you completely naked, chain you to the wall, and give you two buckets. One had water in it, one was for your waist. And every once in a while, if they were feeling generous, they'd give you a loaf of bread. Now, the federal government found out about this in about 78 or 79, we're not really sure which one, they shut it down. When they came back here in 81 to visit, they said, we told you to shut that down.
be able to do that in a couple weeks if the restrictions lift it. Um, exactly. I, I said the same thing. I'm not in charge of it. But uh, we do want to take this time to tell you about our Halloween tour. You see that pipe coming out the wall and going around? We, we are number six in the nation for, scared, uh, for scary hell haunted houses. What we do is we bring you in, we put you in a cell, we take you out, we'll put you in an electric chair, it will electrocute you and you will have died. We will then put you in a coffin and we'll push you through the wall and you get to ride in a coffin. And then you died in prison, so you know you ain't going up. You're going down, you slide down that tube, you go into the basement, and then we all start to get scared. Uh, nice. I hope you enjoyed the tour today. If you did, uh, go to TripAdvisor. My name's Lee.